Okay, so uh, thanks um, for that introduction. I am Helena Patterson. I am a lecturer at the University of Glasgow, a lecturer in psychology. Um, and my the subject that I, I'm going to talk about today is social psychology, but I also have a wider interest in um, open science and open science practices and how to um, include open science um, in education. So a lot of what I do is really about um, kind of wider than just, the, just teaching um, my topic. But I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about um, uh, an assessment that I use quite regularly um, and um, that some people found interesting, so I thought I'd share it here. Okay, just a little bit about what I'm going to do today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the rationale behind what we're doing, um, the details of the assessment, um, some student reflections and challenges and opportunities. So first of all, just a little bit about the course. Um, the courses that I teach. So I teach a large number of students. Um, uh, social psychology is a core topic um, that we um, teach here. So all our students, whether they are undergraduate or whether they are uh, conversion students, if they get a BPS accreditation, um, they need to cover this as one of their courses. And there's a few courses like that that we have in the school that um, basically all our students do. So that's a real opportunity for us to develop skills that we care about and that we think will be valuable for students because all our students are going to have that. When I teach it um, online, it's uh, 20, it, it goes over 20 weeks. And when I teach it in person, um, it goes over 12 weeks. So you see, it's not a long time that, that we have. I need to cover um, everything needed for social psychology for a BPS accredited MSc conversion course. Um, so um, really 12 weeks isn't a lot for that um, and um, that's kind of like part of the rationale for why I use this assessment as well. But the other thing that we have um, in our subject and um, not just in our subject but in teaching science in general but also in a lot of other subjects um, is just really how applicable is our science and how generalizable is it to um, other situations and other places. This is especially key in social psychology, um, which is one of these areas. Um, I'm, it's not just only there's, there's lots and lots of areas like this that people go to and they are interested in finding out how can this be applied to a real situation. We saw particularly during COVID times for during COVID, for instance, that psychologists were some of the people that were um, called into um, talk with the government government bodies. Um, about you know how human behavior and um and and how people behave so i think it's particularly important for us to really focus on these kinds of things when we're thinking about uh, what we teach so just what kinds of things do we actually want to build because you can't build everything so i want to try and encourage students to develop critical evaluation skills um i want to give them some experience of collaboration we were just talking there about um, distance learning and how do you actually humanize it for for students or how do you actually bring students into um, your subject a little bit better. Um, so that's kind of something um, that, that I'm really interested in as well. But the other thing is to give students some kind of choices as well. Very often in our assessment especially they don't really have a lot of choice um, and this is an opportunity to do that. But one of the major things that I'm really concerned about is giving students a voice, especially those who are normally quiet in academic settings. Um, and the kinds of classes that I teach, which is a lot of students, um, you can easily have a few people that are noisy and um, really share their thoughts, but then you can have other people that, that don't do that because they, they prefer to be quiet. So um, it's nice to give those people um, a chance to practice um, writing or sharing their opinions um, with others. But um, the final thing is that um, I really want students to be part of this knowledge creation um, process because all that we can really teach them is a basis and um, from there they need to uh, take things a little bit further. Just a little bit on um, some of those uh, key things. One um, of the things that I teach my students about, but um, uh, it's kind of like a central basis of some of the things of, of why I'm interested in students having a voice is this idea um, of um, the academic wheel of privilege 
or and I think there's privilege wheels um, around and there's loads of different versions of this. But this particular one was developed by um, some colleagues um, in psychology. Um, and just and just recently shared. And this is the kind of way of talking with people about the about the idea of who actually holds the power, who actually creates knowledge and what are the gaps that we see. So I, I always run this exercise with my students. Um, the maximum score that you can get on this, if you give yourself look at the academic wheel of privilege and give yourself a score for everything and count it up, the maximum you can get is 60 and the minimum you can get is 20. In our class, typically about a quarter of students answer, and we always get very similar results somewhere between uh, 40 and 50 is the score, right? So that's kind of like in the upper end of privilege, according to um, this academic wheel of privilege. And I like to talk to my students about the fact that that means that there are so only 25 for percent of them answered. That means that those were the people who most probably had the capacity to do an extra task like this, because it's not part of their assessment or anything. It's a voluntary extra thing. So if they just start thinking about the idea that fewer people are able to engage in voluntary things, which means that they maybe are missing out on opportunities. And there could be various reasons. I have a whole variety of different kinds of students. Some of them, it might just be that they're shy. Some of them, it might be that they're working students. Some of it might be that they have caring responsibilities and so can only really focus on the, on the core things. But eventually what this kind of thing results in is that those people don't get to practice the way that they, they're going to talk. They don't get to contribute in the same way. And there's many reasons why people don't contribute, but and those are just some of them. So I feel that it's helpful to give more people, people who don't traditionally have a chance to contribute or who stay quieter, this chance to uh, practice sharing their ideas. The other thing I'm really interested in is collaborative or cooperative learning. And this is just from a paper in 2009 by Johnson & Johnson, where they just highlight some of the really fantastic things that you can get from co cooperative learning. So cooperative attitudes um, in terms of, you know, working with other students were highly correlated with a wide variety of indices in psychological health, which is something that I'm very interested in um, in my students. More specifically, cooperativeness is positively related to emotional maturity, while adjusted social relations, strong personal identity, the ability to cope with adversity, social competencies, basic trust and optimism about people, self-confidence, independence and autonomy, higher self-esteem and increased perspective taking skills. So all of these things, you know, this is, seems to be like a magic bullet kind of thing. If you can get people to be a little bit more collaborative, a little bit more cooperative, it seems to possibly have all these benefits. So how do we get these benefits um, when actually what I have are very often, you know, through this semester, I have about 500 students all together across three different classes. We don't really have the capacity to offer small groups. So how do you get this collaborative feeling, this cooperate, this cooperative um, attitude? How, how can you build that in a class? And that's really another thing that I was interested in developing in students. And um, finally, the um, other thing that um, I thought was really interesting is just um, the idea of authentic assessment. So collab collaborative debate is um, very much part of scientific advancement. So this is an authentic task, it's something that you actually find in other places, but very often students don't get to have a voice in those kinds of debates. It's always like the researchers or the professors or um, the lecturers that seem to have that debate. So I wanted to help students to build the skills and to just take part in those conversations because obviously, you know, this science is not going to just be my science, it's going to turn to their, their science soon enough. So how can um, our curriculum be shaped by the learners as well? And, you know, as I say, there's a lot of students, so there's a lot of variety of, of people um, that I teach. Um, and what is a manageable way in which we can let all those people shape their own curriculum a little bit while also keeping things, um, how shall I put it, core to the BPS, <laughs> you know, so core to the things that I'm, I'm expected to teach. Um, and really what I wanted for students to do was to learn how to build a class knowledge base themselves. So 
right at the beginning, I set up the situation where I tell students what the teacher's responsibilities are and what the whole class is. Now, the whole class are teachers and students, but mostly the, the, the students work on on extending the, the, the knowledge base. So the teacher's responsibilities are to teach foundational content, teach them a little bit about theory, teach them a little bit about research, provide opportunities to build their skills, you know, so for instance, um, give directed learning activities, give readings, things like that. And also, of course, to provide feedback. So the teachers have one set of responsibilities, but then in order to extend their knowledge base, the students need to get involved and they can bring to that process the things that interest them, what they find relevant, um, a cu current context that, that interests them or that they think are important, their lived experience. And they do this through collaborative debate. So we first teach them some of the skills or help them to develop some of those skills um, of collaborative debate. Oops, sorry, I've actually moved on and I didn't show you guys the next slide. Um, we teach them some of that collaborative, those collaborative skills by first of all getting them to, to do informal tasks and then we open some debates for them and they, they start doing it much more formally. So there's both an informal component and a formal component. I'm going to talk mostly about the formal component this time. So for this we've developed these asynchronous debates. So students build this knowledge base beyond the set materials um, that we have, beyond the lecture. So they really need to apply the knowledge into different contexts, into new places. So it involves a little bit of problem solving for them. We give them six questions. They're pretty broad questions, and the expectation is that they're going to engage with these questions in some way. It's quite a scaffolded activity. Um, we set the minimum expectations like word counts and we, as I say, we set the questions for them. But then students beyond that choose what aspects of the course that they want to study further. So which, which things they want to elaborate on a little bit. It's asynchronous, so students have flexibility over when to engage um, and how much to engage. So they don't, they're not, they're not forced into one kind of um, engagement. At the end of the year, we give them a portfolio assessment in which we say you need to choose X number of posts that you have contributed um, this semester or through the course. And a second part of it is to include um, a reflection. And the reflection is really just about how they feel their learning has been shaped by the experience, um, um, things like that. It, it's, it's quite open for them. They can also ask for additional feedback or they can indicate their goals that they were trying to work on that we can give them specific feedback on in the, in the assessment as well. The posts are also um, scaffolded. So we have position statements. Everybody has to just write one position statement. Um, we did used to have, they, they could write multiple, multiple pieces, but we soon found that actually students could demonstrate their ability to do these tasks and they could show their learning very easily with actually a minimum, minimal number of posts. And the other thing is that they need to really read lots of other students things. So you don't want to overdo it for them. You don't, you don't want to add too much there. Um, but they need to clearly state their position and justify it. Um, they get to do this in 700 words, so it's not so much. But they need to learn how to write um, concisely and be picky of ideas. It needs to be evidence based. Um, it needs to give details of research. So we can you can make as many rules or as many, many things, requirements here as you want. But what all this sums down to is that um, it is a professional piece of writing that we expect from them. And the final thing is that we do want them to really care about the, the, the thing that they're writing. We want them to show some interest in this. Um, and then in terms of the debate, something that students, because many of our students come from a, a tradition, you know, a different kind of tradition of learning. Um, where their voice has never been encouraged necessarily before, where there was always some form of right answer. So um, it can be a bit challenging for them to accept the fact that they are, they're not solely responsible for answering a debate question. 
that really this is a broad question and that everybody's contributions are going to work together to answering it. So it's a little bit of an unspecified thing. It gives them, makes them a little bit uncomfortable. And you can see that in the amount of questions and queries they have about it. But I always try to tell them, well, you know, your questions are really interesting to me because that means that you care, that you're showing you're, you're interested and that you're showing that that you're thinking about this, that, that it's not just a, a mindless task for you. We also ask them to make replies. So, and again, some advice there is to be collegiate, to aim to add knowledge, not to disparage a peer, um, to actually answer their peer, um, to be polite throughout. It, it, the idea is to be professional and polite because there's a wide variety of different people. And throughout the course, we talk about the variety of different kinds of people that there are in the course. And they can see that there's different people in their class, for instance. Um, and the other thing is that um, we do then want them to draw back to the learning objectives for the course. You know, so you always draw that back. Some of the key things about the debates are that it's really transparent. So people see each other's posts. This is not something done behind closed doors. And this can be a bit disconcerting for students to start with. They have opportunities to repost, but we try to say to them, keep this minimal because, you know, your peers have to read this. So don't write things that aren't finished. Of course, it has to be polished pieces with references um, and posts in the assessments must be, be the same um, online as um, as their as their final pieces. So they, they can't choose this as a kind of like filler activity and then actually write their real thing just for the teacher. That that's not that's not really what it's supposed to be about. And we offer them a fair bit of support. So directed learning activities to practice some of the tasks. Um, staff engagement um, and feedback. Um, we do that quite a lot. So the em emojis there, like every one of their posts that they, their formative posts or their, their kind of practice post for di directed learning activities, I put a like on those and write a little um, reflection every once in a while to just tell, com comment on people's um, skills development that I can notice and things like that. Some um, for some of the classes, we can offer a formative submission um, but generally, we try and work on class feedback rather than individual feedback because of the number of students that we have. And of course, we have student hours available for them as well. The reflections are very brief. Um, I'm not going to go in too much detail about this uh, because I do want to give you some chance to answer questions at the end. But um, I just wanted to point out some of the really great things that students have said about this and some of the challenges that we've had. So um, students, um, themes that come back time and time again are people really enjoy that they can see the development of their critical evaluation skills. They can see it as the debates progress. They can see it from one post to another and they get that opportunity to, if they feel that it didn't go well, they can try again. Um, and some of them really do take that. The other thing is seeing their peers writing. This, this the original, the first time I did this was for actually an ethics debate in a research methods class, and um, the and the the students there were in. It was one of their very first pieces of writing, and you could just see their writing skills develop so rapidly through this. Seeing a peer's posts, having to interact with the peer's posts, that really helped them to kind of like just enhance their skills a lot. It, I, I, there's no other way to explain it as in it really helps them to to um, to build their skills, but also um, the, the the diversity that they bring, you know, um, is really gratifying to see when somebody is talking about, you know, personal circumstances and how this relates in a more formal and academic setting. Um, so the students can actually see some of the, the things that we were learning about from an academic perspective, they can see in practice. Some of the barriers that students um, come back with is that it is really intimidating to write for peers. It's, I didn't expect this. I expected that to be something that would be okay, but actually it turns out they would give a lecturer or a marker any sort of thing. But when it comes to writing your peers, people are much more concerned about um, the emperor's new clothes. You know, they're, they're much more worried about that. And that can actually 
some students do experience imposter phenomena related to this um, and they need encouragement to speak up. Um, and that is not necessarily just due to this assessment. It might be due to the way that they've been learning for a long time. Um, some challenges that we have is students are last minute. The last weekend before um, the um, portfolio are due is when the forums are the busiest. Um, and but I think that is part of learning how to just work with um, other people, how to how to be collaborative, and having never had that collaborative experience, people won't or or having had fewer versions of that opportunities for that, people need to negotiate about their own wants and needs versus what the group needs. And and just this is more an opportunity to learn about that rather than a place where we can um, really um, fix that. And I talked about imposter phenomena again. Um, um, upscaling, the smallest class I've ever had it in was about 50 students and the largest class was about 300 um, students. So um, it does really work. But we do need to help students to to figure out how they're going to read all that. We've used it for ethics debates and social debates, but I think um, it can be used in many different settings as long as there is an element of critical evaluation and um, an uncertainty or or, or 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 things where people have to negotiate or de or or, or de debate with each other. So I feel that these offer an authentic assessment um, that develops skills that we value co-creation opportunities between both students and teachers, but um, definitely between teachers. A chance to develop students' writing, and I feel it can be applied in lots of different settings. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions.